last, last bits on sampling. So first of all, let's talk about population and what a population proportion is. So when you collect every possible piece of data, we're talking about the population then. So it's the complete sample space, if you like. So that's known as the population. When we do that, we call it a, a census. So the means of gathering the data is a census when we're talking about a population. So let's say, for example, we're in a particular city which has a million people, and we're interested in knowing how many people, if we knocked on the door and said, excuse me, could you please pick a number between one and 100? And we want to know how many would come back with a prime number. I mean, it's something we would want to know, and it's a very interesting thing. The probability, so the theoretical probability, is known as the population proportion. Because theoretically, if we got every piece of data we could, then it should equal the theoretical probability. So for ours, there are, by the way, 25 prime numbers, less than 100. So it would be 25 out of 100, 0.25. However, that doesn't mean that when you hold a census, 0.25 will come back as that ratio. Because I mean, you can't predict what someone's going to pick. So theoretically, it should be 0.25. Now, when I did a, a simulation where I got my spreadsheet to crunch out a million numbers below 100, it actually turned out that uh, 249,925 of them were prime numbers. So in reality, you still might not get that population proportion. But when we talk about a population proportion, we're talking the theoretical probability of, of what it should be. Okay, right? And that, there's the reason why. I can't predict what the response is going to be. So I can't guarantee that the census will come up with what I was expecting, the 0.25. Okay, so that's population proportion. So that's the theoretical answer, the actual probability. Sample proportion then. So we're now going to sample. Conducting a census is not always realistic. It might take too long. Okay, so if I wanted to go talk to all a million people, it's going to take me some time. Uh, it might cost too much. If I'm employing people to go and survey, um, then to do everybody, it's going to cost a lot. And that, that's why the actual Australian Bureau of Statistics, the census, they only do that every it's five years. Yeah, because it's just too expensive to do it every year. The other reason is if you're going to collect a lot of data, the time it takes to analyse that data is going to be time consuming as well so it may not be practical if what actually happens in reality is we we don't often do census we just conduct a sample when we're sampling it's no longer a census that's what we call a survey we would like if it was possible that our sample end up with all the characteristics of the population but again there's no way of ensuring that if we're randomly sampling I surveyed 100 people from our city. I asked them to pick a number below, uh, between 1 and 100. It ended up coming back 29, came back with a, a prime number. So the sample proportion then, the sample proportion is not the theoretical prob probability, it's what I got back from my survey. So 29 out of 100, 0.29 would be the sample proportion. So if our random variable is binomially distributed, so we know it has a, um, n, we're doing it n times, and the probability of it happening is p. The sample proportion, so I don't want the whole distribution, can't survey the whole lot. I'm gonna go a sample proportion. We define it to be x, so our binomial distribution, but divided by n. So the probability then that my sample proportion is equal to x on n ends up being the same as the probability that x equals x, ideally, which would be our binomial probability ncx, probability of it happening to the power of x, probability of it not happening to the power of n minus x. But notice in there that's the theoretical probability, not the sample probability. What we would expect is that the sample proportion would be the same as the population proportion, right? so the theoretical probability. The variance, though, or variation, um, would be that the p times 1 minus p, but now we would divide it by the number of people we're sampling. 
Because right? the variants we'd actually expect to be different to the, the population. So P carrot gives an estimate of our theoretical probability. Prior to conducting that survey of 100 people, I wanted to see if 100 would actually be a big enough sample to draw conclusions about the overall population. And so sometimes you might do this rather than wasting time. Like if it's not going to be a good sample, then I might rethink it and go, well, maybe I need to sample more people, or maybe it's too many people. Maybe I only need to do less. So we end up running, well, I did, 50 simulations on the, using a spreadsheet, and the number of primes produced in the simulations are in the table. Now, P hat, carrot, that's going to equal the proportion of people choosing a prime number. And there's the results from the 50 simulations. Now, remember, we're expecting to get an answer of 0.25. And sometimes that did happen. Sometimes it didn't happen. So my expected one is 0.25. Right. Remember, there are 25 prime numbers below 100. So I would expect 0.25. Now, the variance should turn out to be 0 0.00375. Now, by the way, I have not used these numbers to work this out. This all comes from the theoretical probability. Because, again, I can't predict what people are going to pick. I might end up with another time where I run 50 simulations and amazingly every single one of them comes out to be 0.25. I mean, it's possible. It could happen. So I don't use my experimental data to work this out. Here's the question. I should have done it before I gave you those answers, but anyway, still make this decision. Do you think that that would be a good survey? Remember, we're expecting to come back with an answer of 0.25. We are expecting some sort of spread there of results. But do you think surveying 100 people is good enough? Let's see. Let's say um, I'm going to be happy if we uh, if produce an estimate that's within 5% of the actual results. So P, remember, 0.25. So therefore, I'm saying that P carrot is going to be in between... 0.2375 and 0.2625. So 5% either side of, of what the actual probability or the theoretical probability is. Okay. Now, P carrot is defined to be X on the number that I'm sampling. I'm sampling 100. So from that, I can work out that, well, X has to be in between 23.75 and 26.25. Remember, x is representing our random variable in our binomial distribution. So now I can say, righto, I want to know what is the probability. Now, you'll notice I haven't used 23.75 and 26.25 because binomial probability is a discrete um, distribution. So I know it's never going to equal 23.75, it's never going to equal 26.25, but if I sort of want to include 26.25, well, then I'd, I'd really need to go up to 27. And if I want to include 23.75, I really need to go down to 23. So I've pushed it out a bit so I can include those, those values. Well, fortunately, there's only one, two, three, four, five calculations to do on this one. So I don't need to do an approximation. I can work this one actually out. And we get 0 0.43601. So using that, we're saying, well, there's a 44% chance that we'll get results that are within 5% of what I want. Now, is that good? Is that bad? That's where I guess it just becomes a bit subjective then, whether you think, yeah, no, 44%, that's good enough. Some people might say it's not good enough. But let's do a normal approximation, see if that makes a difference. So the normal approximation, remember P, 0.25. So we said we want P carrot to be in between 0.2375 and 0.2625. Now I'm going to need the uh, standard deviation, so uh, square root of the variation that we worked out before. So that's 0 0.0612. So if I now normalize it, I know on the top I'm going to get 0 0.05. So remember, it's 5% either side of the mean is what we're saying. So the top's got to be 0 0.05. Remember, we divide that by the, the deviation. So that's basically our Z score. 
I've got an absolute value, so we go either side. That turns out to be uh, 0.8170. So two lots of that minus one, we actually end up with 0 0.58608. So by normalizing the, the data using approximation, I've now got it to a 59% chance. Now it's the same data. <laughs> um, feels like I've just gone, oh, well, I didn't like that result. So now I'll use this and oh, look, I got a better result. It's now 59%. Now, I, I'd be happy with 59%, to be honest. So my subjective answer to this one that, yeah, I'd, I'd say a sample size of 100 is, is good enough. Oh, before I move on to the next one, the reality is, I printed it out before, I didn't put it on here, but when I did those, the, um, the variation of the actual ones, my sample one that I did before, that I showed up, um, so 0 0.00375 was the theoretical one. Turns out that for all that data, it's 0 0.00164. You might think, oh, again, you might look at that and go, is that great? Is that not great? But when we're talking about spread, that's why we have deviation. We actually find the square root of those numbers. Square root of that one is 0 0.06. The square root of the, the uh, data that I found there is 0 0.04. So it's not that bad. It's still an okay model. All right, let me say this about that first example. I've done an example of where we're not only saying I'm going to do so many surveys, within the survey I'm also surveying a lot of people. So here, this example, this is the one that's from the sample paper. So it's probably going to give us a better idea of the sort of thing they might uh, ask us. So a recent census showed that 20% of the adults in a city go and eat out regularly. They've got a survey at 100 adults, and all they're asking us for the first part of the question is, oh, well, show that the mean and standard deviation turn out to be this. Okay, well, the mean is P, and uh, P is 0.2. They've told us that, so okay, got that. The deviation would be the square root of the variance. So P, 1 minus P over N, oh yes, that works out to be 0.04. I think you'll agree, a much easier question than the first example there. But that's, as I say, that's the sort of thing they put in the sample paper to give us a guide. As to They then said, all right, well, they put a table in there, see, that way you're not disadvantaged if your calculator doesn't do it. So using this table, we have to estimate the probability that a survey of 100 adults will find at most 15. So we're now saying the probability that Z is less than 0.15 minus 0.2 over 0.04. So the, the mean minus etc. Cetera, et cetera. So the Z score. Well, that turns out to be negative 1.25. Well, the table they gave us hasn't got the negatives, so we're going to have to play around with this. That would be the same as going 1 minus, and then we can look up the cumulative frequency of 1.25. So 1.25. I'll go along from 1.2, down from 0 0.05, and there's our answer, 0.8944. So subtract that from 1, and we get 0 0.1056. That, I guess, is more likely the sort of thing that they might 